In this video, I'll cover a major update to my original ESP8266 based parking assistant. Among the new version highlights I'll cover are support for the ESP32 and a brand new lateral or left right guidance option. <laughs> Welcome to Resin Chem Tech. One of my more popular projects out there, at least based on feedback and the number of you that I've heard from, is my parking assistant that uses an ESP8266 and a strip of WS2812B LEDs. Now this is a great beginner project that's pretty easy to do and it actually has practical application as well as offering optional home assistant integration. But there were two primary requests, well, actually there were a lot of requests, but two of them were most common for this project. And the first was to add support for the ESP32, and the other was to add some sort of lateral or left-right guidance to the system, as well as the forward and back positioning that are currently there. Well, I'm happy to announce that the latest version of the firmware actually adds both of these requests, along with a few other improvements. Now, in this particular video, I'm only going to cover these new features. I'll show some of the minor wiring differences between the ESP8266 and the ESP32 version, but if you want to see the complete build details for the system, you need to go back and watch that original video first. It has the complete build details, installation of the firmware, and covers a lot of the options and settings, so I'm not going to cover those again here. In addition, the GitHub and written blog article will also be updated with this new information. And of course, links to the GitHub wiki and the blog article can be found in the video description, so make sure you check there after the video as well. So now let's take a look at some of the major enhancements in this release. First is new support for the ESP32. Honestly, I initially rebuffed requests to update the firmware to the ESP32 because the ESP8266 was more than adequate for this project and the ESP32 really didn't add anything other than cost to the project. But with expressive support for the ESP8266 ending in a few years, and many other projects like WLED are already moving to the ESP32, I felt it was time for me to do the same. Functionally, there's just one source code file for both the 8266 and the ESP32. The only difference is in the compile step for the different ESPs that create a different binary for each version. Now, the ESP32 version is compiled under the standard ESP32 dev module, so it should be compatible with any current ESP32. It might be possible to adapt this to code for the other ESP32s like the S series or the C series, but that likely would require changing the board definition and maybe some of the actual source code and compiling a new version. So for now, I can only support the standard ESP32. Now I'm using an ESP WROOM32 for development and testing. I'll be showing the ESP32 Mini, but the system was also tested with a standard ESP32 Node MCU style board as well. As an aside, I also changed the board definitions for the ESP8266 to generic for better compatibility with ESP8266 boards other than the D1 Mini. When looking at the controller and compared to the original ESP8266 wiring, the ESP32 version is nearly identical. Yes, the ESP32 uses different GPIO pins, and as shown here, an optional side sensor can be added for the lateral guidance, which I'll cover in a bit. Other than the side sensor, the functionality of the system is the same regardless of which ESP you use. However, the 32, as expected, is quite a bit more responsive when it comes to the web interface. Now, copies of these diagrams are available in the companion blog article. For my development and testing, I built my controller with pin headers and used a Wemos D1 Mini and an ESP32 Mini. Now, since both these controllers have the LED signal line in the same physical location, although with a different GPIO number, but the firmware handles that automatically, I can swap out the two different boards without having to do any real re rewiring. The only exception are the pins for the TF Mini. But to handle that, I simply created two separate leads for the TF Mini. When I want to use the ESP8266, I connect the TF Mini to these leads and then to the other set of leads when I want to use the ESP32. Now, before you jump down to the comments, yes, I could have actually used the same RX and TX pins for the ESP32 as well, since they're located at the same spot as they are on the D1 Mini. But on the ESP8266, this means the TF Mini sensor cannot be used at the same time as serial output via the USB bus. With the ESP32, however, the TF Mini can be connected to a secondary hardware serial bus, leaving the primary serial bus available for troubleshooting should it become necessary. 
and you probably won't build a controller with dual support for both the ESP types like I did here for testing. But if you are just starting out and building your first controller, I now recommend the ESP32 instead of the 8266 because to be honest, it's a lot of extra work to develop, test, and maintain multiple versions of the same firmware. So at some point, I may need to drop ESP8266 support like many other projects out there are currently doing. But the most important aspect of adding support for the ESP32 is that it allows for the addition of that secondary distance sensor for lateral guidance. Yes, that means, at least for now, lateral guidance currently requires the ESP32 version of the controller. Now, the prior version only provided guidance for the forward position of the car. A quick recap of how the system works is that there are four parking zones with the TF Mini sensor located at the front of the parking location. When a car enters the wake zone, the system wakes from sleep mode, showing solid LEDs in your choice of color. And when the car pulls forward and enters the active zone, the LEDs will begin a countdown. Again, both the color and type of approach pattern is customizable, but will show an approach until the car hits the ideal parked zone. Now, if a car does pull too far forward in the backup zone, the LEDs will flash. The system works well, but it doesn't provide any left, right, or lateral guidance. Now, in your particular garage or parking situation, lateral positioning may be as important as forward or medial positioning. In addition, lateral guidance can also improve the accuracy of the forward position. Since the front of most vehicles are curved, a difference in the lateral position can impact the measurement of that forward or front sensor. Here's an example of two vehicles that are essentially parked the same distance from the front wall, but the car on the bottom is laterally shifted to the left, resulting in a longer distance from the sensor due to the curved front from the car. So if the start of the park zone begins at 16 inches, the car on the bottom must actually pull forward another two inches to reach the reach the park zone, meaning this car is now closer to the front wall than the car on the top, despite both showing the same distance from the sensor. Having lateral guidance can also help the situation by assuring the car is parked in the same left-right position when approaching the front sensor. And do note that the system designs the lateral sensor to be placed on the left or the right side of the vehicle. Of course, to add lateral guidance, we need to add a second distance sensor. The current front sensor is a TF Mini. Now these particular sensors don't come cheap at around $45 to $50 a piece, but I cover why this sensor was selected in the original video, including some real-world tests of various distance sensors. The TF Mini has a stability and precision at a range that works well for a vehicle approaching through the various parking zones. So when it came to adding a second side sensor, my first inclination was to simply add another TF Mini. But this would skyrocket the total project cost. Instead, I opted to use a different sensor from my original testing, which is the VL53LOX. Now, this had good stability in testing, but isn't appropriate for the front sensor due to its limited range. However, for a side sensor, and as long as the park position of the vehicle is within about three feet of a sidewall or other location for mounting the sensor, then it should work just fine and will only add about $5 to the total project cost. Now, before you jump down to the comments, yes, something like this HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor would probably also work for the side sensor. This would require modification of the source code, so if that's something you'd like to try, I'll leave that exercise to you, as I will likely only be able to support the sensors that I show here and in the related blog article. But let's take a quick look at my final installed system with lateral guidance in action. I've installed my new system here in the garage, and, and for me, it was very simple because there's my old controller sitting right down here, and all I had to do is take it down and put in the new ESP32 controller. And since I use things like JST and DuPont connectors, it was no problem to swap this out and keep the existing power supply and LED light strip. The only other thing I had to do was install my new side sensor, which is installed right over here. All right, we'll give this a shot actually in the car now. I think I've got the distances pretty close. And thanks to Mrs. Rez and Kim Tech here, who's actually holding the camera for me. Okay, there the system is awake, so I've entered the wake zone, just like always. Now I'm in the active zone. I'm going to get up here far enough that that right-hand sensor ought to start picking up the car. There it goes. That helped me right on the edge. I'm just a little bit too far to the right, so I'm going to correct back to the left until that stops blinking. There we go. Overcorrected. I want neither one of those ends to be flashing. Got a pretty narrow zone here. That's pretty close until I hit the park zone. So here's another test with Mrs. Resin Kim behind the wheel. This is actually her parking spot. Now she pulls forward. 
She's going to enter the wake zone, which wakes the system, and then the approach zone, which starts that countdown. Now, you can just see the side sensor indication on the LEDs as she nears the field of view of the side sensor. And now that she's within that field of view, notice it is telling her that she needs to correct a little bit to the left. She does that just as she hits the final parking zone. After a few days of use, I decided to move this side sensor a little further back into the active zone. The original position was a little bit too close to the park zone and really didn't provide the driver enough distance to correct the lateral position before hitting that final parked position. I also placed it slightly higher to avoid the tire wells and just slightly widen the side zone to help with overcorrections. You'll probably need to experiment with the side sensor position for the best results as I did here. But the updated system allows the car to be parked in the same location with the new lateral guidance eliminating the front sensor variances due to the curved front of the car. But let's move back to the bench and take a look at how the side sensor is configured. I've set up my development system here on the bench for the rest of this video. Now it's identical to the one installed in the garage, except obviously I've changed all the distances here from my bench test version. This is the TF Mini, which is my front sensor. And over here at the side is the VL53LOX side sensor. Now I would normally have that farther back in the active zone, not quite as close to the park zone, but I wanted to be able to squeeze it here in the camera. So that's what we'll go with would be enough to give you an idea of how the system works. Okay, I've turned the lights down a little bit. Hopefully you can still hear me because I'm standing up to try to keep my arm out of the way. But I'm going to go ahead and drop our car in like we're coming into park. And you can see that it's already in the active zone. But notice I'm getting a little bit of flashing here because the sensor is just starting to pick up the front of the car. But as I start to pull forward, I can navigate a little bit to my right until those lights stop blinking on this side of the board. So I bring my car up here, continuing to steer a little bit. Okay, so now I can straighten it out. If I move a little bit too far to the right, then it's going to start flashing on the other side to tell me to move back to the left. So I can do that to keep the car in the lateral position, continue pulling forward until I do reach that parked position. Let's take a quick look at how the side sensor is defined here in the web application. With this version of the firmware, there's a new sensor settings section. Now do note that all of the settings for the side sensor are listed under the ESP32 base controllers only. You do need to use an ESP32 for lateral guidance. If you're using an ESP8266, then you'll see this message and you won't see any of the options for the side sensor. But if you do have a side sensor installed, it can be enabled or disabled at any time. When enabled, we have to tell it whether the side sensor is on the left hand or right hand side of the car because this affects our distances. The way these distances work might be a little bit different than you expect. Here I have a left distance of 7 inches and a right distance of 5 inches. Again, this is scaled down from my bench test. But if you kind of look, this white line right here is about 5 inches from my sensor. So if the car were to move closer than 5 inches, then that's going to cause the LEDs here on the right hand side of the strip to start flashing to tell me to move the car to the left. However, if I get out here far enough that the left-hand side of the car is more than 7 inches, which is this line, then that's going to cause the LEDs over here on this side of the strip to begin flashing, telling me to navigate the car back to the right. So you can easily set this up so that your sensor can be on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the car. You just need to adjust your left and right distances accordingly. There are numerous other improvements, fixes, and quality of life updates in this release. For example, there's new onboarding and Wi-Fi procedures. This no longer relies on antiquated third-party libraries, but my own custom code will hopefully resolve some early issues folks had with unusual SSIDs or passwords. The over-the-air firmware update process has been overhauled, again eliminating a third-party library. And finally, the configuration file storage was moved from the depreciated SPFs to LittleFS. All these changes are detailed in the GitHub release notes and the wiki, including upgrade instructions if you already have a parking assistant. Again, you can find links down in the video description. So I toyed and experimented with a lot of different methods for adding lateral sensing to the parking assistant. I ended up opting for this method because it adds minimal cost and minimal additional wiring. But let me know down in the comments if you find an alternate way to add lateral sensing to the parking assistant. And of course, I'm always happy to answer questions. Obviously, ESP32 and lateral sensing support are brand new to the system, and I can only test in my garage for my particular parking situation. So I'd be happy to hear from any of the rest of you out there that either build a system with lateral sensing or upgrade your previous parking assistant to add ESP32 and lateral guidance. 
I'll be back soon with more videos on DIY electronics and home automation. But until that time, I'd like to say thank you for watching, and I hope to see you soon.